I'm Mike. Uh, I'm one of the design engineers for both Turner and ECS Tuning. Uh, this is my Unimog. I was the weird kid that always asked for tools for Christmas. So I asked for a welder for a few years and finally got one freshman or sophomore year in high school. And I had never welded before. So at that time, I was just, I was playing with like go-karts and like tractors and stuff, like things that were usually broken and free that I could get and then just, you know, kind of cobble together to make something different. I did that with like my first off-road rig. I had a, like a Toyota 4Runner that was pretty beat and did a bunch of stuff to that, like one ton axles and 38s and ran that for a long time and then everything was packed together and pretty shitty. So I sold that and got a Land Rover and kind of did the whole process again and then it's transferred into this. This is a 404 Unimog. So it's, I think, 55 to just about the early 80s they made these. A Unimog is kind of a weird design. Like the engine and trans are mounted together and they are, you know, it's mounted on rubber bushings at the back and then like a pivot kind of leaf spring shackle at the front. They articulate from frame twist. So everything's riveted, everything is allowed to flex. And because of that, nothing's solid mounted. So that's why the engine stays stationary, the frame twists around it. Same with the cab, there's only two solid mounts at the back and then one uh, rubber bushing pivot at the front so that the frame can twist around it without breaking the cab. And then the bed's the same way, there's a bushing at the front and the back and then a solid mount in the center. So that's how you get all your articulation for off-road stuff while still having a decent payload uh, from the springs. The other you know, main draw to these Unimogs is they have portal axles. So normally, you know, your wheel's bolted to either end of the axle, all your gearing's done in the differential. Um, these are similar except there's a gearbox on the end where the wheels would be that drop it both down and give you more gear reduction. So the axles are significantly stronger and you get a ton more uh, ground clearance. As far as the bed goes, it's you know, all fabricated steel tubing around the outside. There's three tailgates, all of which are easily removable. Um, my whole plan behind this was to have no tools to utilize, utilize any of it, like to remove tailgates or open anything. So I made these latches for this rear one, both sides. You can kind of just open these and then it folds down. And then I've got just traditional tailgate straps here, but you can undo these. relatively easily. And you can fold it most of the way down or pick it up at a 45, it comes off. It's kind of heavy. These pockets, they're all just resitch sized, like a traditional hitch. So I can put anything I want in there from here out if I ever decide I want to make you know pockets on all four corners or whatever, I can make stuff to adapt to this size as the, the rear ones, so it's all the same part. These lift off, and then, whoops, these go on like that. The little dirt bikes and four-wheelers are just walking into whichever. So normally, like the doors come off these easy like a Jeep, but you don't have anywhere to put them. Same deal as a Jeep. So I've made little mounts at the back, just the same, basically the exact same hinge. So I can drop the doors in and then close them up against the back so they're not in the way or anything. This one I had to put a little hole. This, I did a little dimple die hole here because the little keyhole for the driver's glove box in the door. So I can not die coming down this. Um, we got three, well, four snaps here. A wing nut up here. And same on the other side. Up. 
the center of the hub is a step on these. That's why the front wheel looks a little different than the rear wheel. It's actually something that just bolts on to three of the lugs. And that's what you use to just hop up into the thing. So there's also a handle on either side to get in. There's a gray handle here, gray handle over here. It's pretty simple in here, but it took a lot to get here. So it's just, these were all 24 volt originally. Uh, I converted everything to 12 volt and there's different gauges now because back in the day they used a very oddball size. I don't recall what it is now, but these are the normal, you know, two and a 16th inch gauges, but the hole was actually bigger in the Unimog dash uh, originally. So I made this adapting kind of bezel piece. I had plasma cut out. I found a speedometer that fit. Um, and then I put in a couple more indicators here. So I have, you know, left and right turn signal, oil pressure, high beam, and glow plugs. This is the defroster. So there's this weird little clamshell here that just kind of directs air across the windshield. Um, heat's not great in this, not terrible, mostly because the engine's next to you, but you don't get a ton of airflow. Uh, I've got just a turn signal, just a universal thing here. The steering column is quite a bit different. It would have been moved over a little bit originally and straight to the manual steering box. Now I have a little bit of linkage and some U-joints that go to the power steering box, which makes it a lot nicer to drive. Uh, this is supposed to be for a hand throttle. That's another thing I haven't gotten around to yet. So just if you had PTOs or if you're doing off-road stuff and you wanted to just bump it a little bit off idle or you know, kind of cruise control mode, this would be the little throttle lever. Uh, I've got USB just because modern. The closest you get to AC in this thing, other than keeping the doors off, is just this little flap here, which actually directs a ton of air at you. The transmission is one of the most difficult things to figure out on this, and it looks pretty simple because you really, there's a bunch of levers in there, but as far as shifting is concerned, there's two that you really care about but the pattern's goofy and there's a bunch of weird lockouts. So there's forward and reverse on this lever here. You have first and second gear in forward and reverse. You can't go over into the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth while it's in reverse. You have to go in forward, then you can go through, this is the detent I was talking about for PTOs. So this, you can't do anything. It freaks a lot of people out if you let them drive it because it's a pretty strong detent. You have to like really deliberately knock it out of that. Um, now, you'll notice I can't go over to fifth and sixth. I can do you know fourth gear, and then if I go into third gear, that unlocks a detent, so now I can go to fifth and sixth. It unlocks that gate. So now I have road gears, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So you really just treat it like a four speed. Um, and by the time you're doing 30 miles an hour, you're in sixth anyway. So from there out, you just pin it. This is four wheel drive. So that actuates the front axle. And this is just parking brake. Normally, this would have had three positions. I changed it. So the first one would have been four wheel drive and then you would pull it up another thing and hold it for the front and rear lockers. So you had to hold it the whole time to have the front and rear lockers. I put those on air because I don't want to have to hold it and it was a little easier. It would have been a straight six uh, gasoline 2.2 liter engine that made about 80 horse. They're known to be really slow and you know, they're usually RPM limited, but originally uh, power limited. So this one I swapped in the OM617, which is a five cylinder turbo diesel out of like a mid eighties 300D. So it's about 130 horse. It's quite a bit better, but it's still painfully slow. Um, these would have also had just manual steering why it's got the giant steering wheel and manual brakes, just single line master stuff. So that's now has Hydro Boost out of like an E28 M5 and a Chevy Astrovan steering box so I can put power steering in it. So it's reasonable to drive now. I'm not constantly panicking. It's quite a bit more power, but it took quite a bit to get it in here too. It's, as you can see, super cozy. The fuel filter is just about touching the floor here. The turbo is just about touching the floor on the other side. Uh, to get all the coolant lines over to the heater core, I had to make all these stainless lines that go from the back of the cylinder head and mount 
uh, onto the valve cover and then are integrated into this mount for the radiator here. You can't really see the engine mount down here, but everything is designed to pivot because of that. So the engine kind of floats a little separate than the cab. That's why the radiator is mounted to the engine by this little link here. It's mounted on two rubber bushings at the bottom and then the one here. So it kind of just floats with the engine in the frame. Uh, it's using a factory style air box, but these had an oil element to clean the air. So it just pulled fuel through a little oil screen and then back up so the oil would grab all the dirt. But diesels can run off oil, so you don't want to do that. So I cut it apart and welded a new tube in and there's a little just typical cone air filter in there. Just so the air box looks the same. It pulls in through these cool looking vents on the outside, but it's a little more functional for this engine. I've got the power steering and power brake reservoir here because it is hydro boost. Hydro boost is, you know, the power steering pump provides pressure to a little cylinder. In this, uh, I used the cylinder off of an E28 M5 because a friend of mine had a parts car. So I use that and the reservoir to mount that. Um, it's a pretty good power steering cooler behind here. Just because off-road stuff, you end up sawing the wheel a bunch and overheating your fluid. We've got, I think, a Chevy like van um, washer fluid bottle that fit nice. I just found it at the junkyard and it looked like the right shape. And it fit really nice. So pretty happy with that. There's some universal fuse panel stuff. These are just kind of, a lot of marine guys use these, but everything's run through these and these relays back here. I made this little aluminum panel to hold everything and fit the little relay holders here. These, the power steering pump on this engine would have been mounted way outside of where it could be. It would have been in the floor. And the vacuum pump would have been this plate coming off the front of the injection pump. So, it would have been a big giant vacuum pump there. I made this little uh, delete plate here and then was able to put the power steering pump right up against it. Kind of cut down on some of the use of space. There's really nowhere to put anything. Down here is a York uh, air compressor. It's basically the AC compressor out of like anything from, you know, 60s to the early 80s. Mine's out of actually my old Audi. Um, these are an oiled AC compressor so they can't run dry on oil. It's not like the normal stuff now that uses refrigerant as the oil. So you can run these and just compress air without them grenading. All right, so you'll see, you know, the telltale giant Mercedes emblem on this. This is actually a uh, reproduction, so it's actually plastic, but the metal ones are a million dollars now. These are actually the metal original kind of side pieces here. I powder coated these. Uh, these are a newer H4 style headlight into the original buckets. Uh, I pulled all these buckets apart and powder coated them. So there's a million little pieces in there that are all in good shape now. If you know these 404 Unimogs well, you'll notice this one looks a little different. There's two positions you can mount the bumper. If you had a winch, it would mount way out here, or you can mount them up close with these brackets. So I did that as well as cutting, I think four inches out of right here and narrowing them a little bit just because they look like a huge mustache on these and I couldn't stand it. So I took four inches out of either side of those. The fenders were in kind of rough shape a little further in. So I cut, I believe two or three inches out of those and moved those in a little bit as well, which in my opinion looks a lot better and it's still not in the way of the tires once it flexes out. I don't know, I don't, spend money on like initial car purchases. I think the most I've ever spent was two grand on a car. <laughs> 2,200 on the Suburban with the blown engine. That was the most I've ever spent on a car. For a lot of people, it's intimidating on taking something apart and like potentially ruining something valuable that you bought, like a car. Um, I've never had any issue with that, whether it's expensive or not. I seem to have no issue cutting it apart and ruining it. But uh, like just getting like the cheap project that someone has sitting around like just to practice on or figure out is totally worth it. You get something, you know, you know, two hundred dollar car to just play around with if you're nervous about that type of thing until you're, you know, build up your confidence. But I don't know. That's what I see most people getting hung up by. They don't want to ruin their expensive thing. I don't know. Get something less expensive, and then it doesn't really matter. There's plenty of things I'll point out now that like. There's almost no thing on it now that I would do again. 
I learned from everything. Like, there's nothing wrong with it, but if I were to do it again, I'd do it differently. And I, that's kind of one of the things I like about building stuff is I'm always learning about it. So when I stop learning and like, if I think it's perfect or whatever, that's probably when I'll find something else to do. But for now, it's every time I build something, I learn a different way to do it and I try something different the next time. So until that stops, I'm gonna keep building cars. Yeah.